Well, today is probably one of the most exciting days for me because I'm interviewing three heroes and mentors and people that I have so much respect for that have taught me so much about what I tell you as my audience. That is Professor Jana Moncrief, Robert Whitaker, who should be Professor Robert Whitaker, seriously. And Mark, I think you are a professor as well, but I know you're doctor. Doctor, okay. You would have heard from the intros at how qualified these three people are in terms of helping us to create a new narrative for mental health. So it's an absolute privilege to have the three of you in studio with me. And hopefully one of these days we'll be able to do it live where we can actually sit next to each other and talk these to these important topics. But welcome to all of you. So much, so, so wonderful to have you here. And if you wouldn't, wouldn't mind, just re, just give us a brief introduction to who each of you are. Jenna, can we start with you? Yes, of course. So I'm Joanna Moncrief, Professor Joanna Moncrief. I'm a professor at University College London in London, and I'm also a practicing psychiatrist in the National Health Service in London. Thank you. Robert? Yeah, my name is Robert Whitaker, and I come at this whole subject from prof- you know, having worked as a journalist for many years. So that's the perspective I bring to it. And I'm the founder and publisher of a website called madinamerica.com. Thank you. Mark? I am a clinical research fellow in psychiatry in the National Health Service in England, and I'm an honorary research fellow at uh, University College London, and I'm also a training psychiatrist. Fantastic. Well, each of you have done individual interviews with me, and so I recommend all of you go and listen to those as well. And today I chose to do this panel just to start diving into some topics that the three of you have such a great blend of experience and to the way you view these that I think it's really great to just hear your opinion. So I'm going to start with the the hot item in the room, which is the paper that you to Joanna, you and Mark and your 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 colleagues released so recently, it was just over a month ago, on throwing finally, hopefully putting the serotonin imbalance chemical myth to bed. Finally, once and for I should say really kill that one in the in in the water, hopefully. But it's had such an incredible reaction. So I'd love you just to dive in and talk about, you know, what initiated the research, what your findings were, whatever you'd like to say about it, and the response that has been huge. This has really taken the world by storm. And, you know, why and the impact and whatever you feel is important for the audience to know about this paper. Joanna, let's start with you. So so I started up doing this research because it had been rumoured within the psychiatric community for a long time that the idea that depression was due to low serotonin was not supported by the evidence. There'd been one or two publications pointing out the inconsistency of the results of various studies of depression and serotonin. But there wasn't really an overview which would allow you to, which would allow anyone to say, well, this is supported or this isn't supported. So I thought this really needs doing. So we started to look into the various areas of research that have been done to try and find out whether there are links between depression and serotonin. And we identified the main areas of research that have gone on in that area, got them together, got all the main main studies together or the main overviews of studies in those different areas together in order to be able to take an overview of, of, of all the research on serotonin and depression and as everyone probably knows by now, we found that none of the research in any of those areas produced convincing evidence that depression is caused by low serotonin, or even that there is a connection between depression and serotonin. We didn't find evidence that people with depression had any obvious or consistent abnormality of serotonin, for example. So yeah, that, that was that was the research that we've just published. As you say, there's been an amazing reaction to it, which I think just highlights how pervasive that idea had become, how convinced everyone was that this was an established fact, that we knew that depression is related to, to low serotonin. And of course, people have been told this for many decades now, and they've been told it in relation to the use of antidepressants, particularly SSRI antidepressants. It has been used as the rationale to justify the use of these medications. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Joanna. That's a great intro. And just jump in wherever. Mark, do you want to pick up and, I don't know, take us wherever, whichever direction? I'd love to hear. So, so, so I think that the, res- the response to the paper is probably worth commenting on because it's been very interesting of it itself. It has been. 
you know, a lot of experts came out and said, you know, this is not news to us that low serotonin is not involved in depression. You know, we, we never thought that. One psychiatrist in England said no respectable uh, psychiatrist or scientist, you know, would ever think that low serotonin causes depression. I, I think it's, you know, in, in stark contrast to that, you know, our paper has become one of the most shared papers in the history of science now. It's sort of a bit a bit ridiculous in some in some ways. You know, out of 21 million papers that have been published, it's now in the top 400 most shared articles. I think, what that, I think what that shows, what that underlines very strongly is vast numbers of people in the public, including journalists we've spoken to, you know, this was absolutely news to them. They had been convinced that there is a chemical imbalance in, in depression, specifically low serotonin, and that medications can fix it. And it's probably fair to say that a lot of academics along the way have contributed to that understanding amongst the public. It probably originated from drug companies to start with, you know, a narrative that makes it very you know, it gives a very convincing rationale why you should take an antidepressant. If you're told, you know, you have low serotonin, then, you know, it's almost a no-brainer to take a drug that increases serotonin. It's a very convincing, you know, narrative. Uh, and in some ways, it's a little bit similar to, to other drug company marketing that they use to make their products here either compelling or not dangerous. And, and the obvious example is Purdue Pharmaceuticals, who marketed OxyContin as not addictive if you have pain, you know, which is a false narrative. And they did that. You know, we know a lot about Purdue because of lawsuits and discovery of their internal documents. They did that because they knew that doctors would be reluctant to prescribe medications that they knew were addictive because everyone who's been through medical school or just read the news knows that opioids are addictive and they needed a, a, a convincing argument to get people over their reluctance, doctors to prescribe and patients to accept it. And they worked out that by saying the sort of sounding plausible idea, if you didn't think about it too much, that opioids are not addictive if you're in pain would be enough to get GPs over their reluctance. And I think the narrative that antidepressants fix an underlying chemical imbalance has the same effect of getting people over their reluctance to take mm. a medication emotional problems, because I think most people find that a somewhat strange thing to do. And having this narrative makes it sound sensible and natural and uh, and, and understandable. And so it, it looks to me like another example of drug company marketing that has convinced the market that their, their products are uh, make more sense to use than they probably do. We've done a bit of work looking at how to go back to the, the role of psychiatrists, how much this idea of low serotonin has been discussed in the literature. So we looked at uh, studies from the 1990s to 2010, a study led by Joanna, looking at how many mentions of this idea was in the literature. And, and it was a very prominent idea put forward about low serotonin. There was large sections of textbooks dedicated to it and academic articles. And so it clearly was an idea that was central to academic discussion about depression. You know, we found there's an old pharmacist getting towards the end of his career who's, who's sort of seen it all. In the, in the early 2000s, he had a record of a piece of promotional material sent around by the manufacturer of Effexor, you know, the, this, the SNRI, the GP in England, and the, and the pamphlet said, signed by very prominent academic psychiatrists in England, it said depression is caused by low serotonin and low, and low noradrenaline. And it was sent to GPs as promotional material. And of course, the drug that was being promoted was Effexor, which increases serotonin and noradrenaline. So it was it was clearly conveyed to doctors by academic psychiatrists that this was the reason for depression. And, and it's you know, no surprise that that stuck around amongst clinicians and, and why, why, why that message is so widespread. Two comments just on what you both said, and then I want to hand over to Robert. And that is the fact that the psychiatrist said, oh, well, we've known this all along, but you've just so clearly said that there's been psychiatrists and pharma, uh, psychopharmacologists, whatever they call themselves, creating pamphlets and training doctors. And the, I know in the States, I think it's the same, pretty similar in the UK. Robert, correct me if I'm wrong here with my stats, but 95% of SSRI prescriptions are coming from our primary care physicians or general practitioners. And that they, they're going from 
the brochure. They're going from the little lecture that they've had at med school. It hasn't been a whole analysis. So, so that messaging has been there, which then puts the ball in your court, Robert, because you wrote the most phenomenal response to this paper being released just over the just a few days back. And you and I spoke about it, and I encourage everyone to go listen to that podcast, where you actually said that this is a this is actually a legal fraud case that is being kind of like oh, it's not a case, but it, it could be it. it justifies looking at this legally. Yeah, two things here real quickly. I, I disagree a little bit with Mark in terms of the gen- or, or origins of this chemical imbalance story at where it's, it's the blame is placed on the pharmaceutical companies. I, I think you can trace it really to the American Psychiatric Association starting to use it to sell its disease model to the public after DSM-3 was published. And then what happened, once they put that idea out there, the drug company said, this is the greatest story ever because we can use it to market our drugs. And of course, they have the money to market it. But I really think the genesis starts with the American Psychiatric Association and with the understandable motive. They were trying to sell a different model to the public once they published DSM-3. And you see it right away. Robert, sorry, you'd probably agree with me. I think it starts even earlier. I mean, it starts in the 60s you know, when when the new drugs are uh, coming in and it gets going through the 70s and then it's picked up by by the APA and again, then later, as you say, picked up by the pharmaceutical industry. But it, it starts in, you know, it's proposed by psychiatrists, isn't it, clearly? Um, yeah, and, 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 and I agree with you, Joanne. If you really want to trace it, it starts when psychiatry wants to present itself as a white coat, uh, you know, yes, medical specialty, which goes to yeah. the 60s. The, the thing mm. about the 80s is this moment they have this new model they definitely want to promote to the public, you know, that mm. they've, they've vanquished the Freudians and that sort of idea. So it really takes yeah, off yeah. them. Yeah. And just in terms of responsibility, but it is true that once they, they float it out there and they start promoting it, the drug companies, they rush to take advantage of that because that's that's fantastic. And here's the other thing is, we and, and you know, as a journalist, I'm always looking at how things are communicated to the public. We in the population should trust the medical specialty to tell us the truth. Yeah. Not the drug companies. So if they didn't have the cover of the APA to do this, they could have never done this. And if the APA wasn't sort of adopting it into its materials and sending out this stuff, this would have fallen flat. It benefited the APA as well. I think one of the things we have to realize here is the, the public it takes the, the for a medical idea to take hold, the medical specialty has to embrace it because they're the ones who are seen as having the legitimacy in society for telling us what is true. And and then what happened after Mark and Joanna published their paper, there was this extraordinary response where people said, oh, yeah, we, we've known that there's nothing new. And actually within Academic research circles, that's pretty true. Yeah. I remember I was giving a grand rounds at Massachusetts General Hospital after I wrote a book called Anatomy of an Epidemic, and they were sort of unhappy with me. And one of the things they were unhappy with me was that I said, oh, you know, this chemical imbalance story was promoted. And they and they said to me, you know, that wasn't fair to us. That idea was discarded 25 years ago. And I said to the people at MGH, yes, it was sort of discarded a long time ago, but I think you forgot to tell the public. In other words, they didn't feel that responsibility. But it's worse than that, because if you really trace the internal communications within the American Psychiatric Association, in 1999, their own textbook said, okay, let's look at this monoamine hypothesis of depression, serotonin is monoamine. And they said, We've looked at it and it hasn't, it hasn't, it hasn't, there's no evidence for it. It hasn't panned out. And then they even sort of made fun of the hypothesis because they said there's no reason that the pathology of a disease should be the opposite of the mechanism of action of the drug. Mm -hmm. So they declared it a dead and buried. But then what happened? You can see that the president of the APA in the next two years, they, they say, they write a magazine article and say, we now know that depression is caused by low serotonin. And in 2005, they put out a press release and said that psychiatrists are specialists in fixing chemical levels in the brain. And they put out a brochure and said that depression is due to chemical abnormalities in the brain. So the point is, within the medical profession, within the psychiatric profession, in at least their pronouncements to the public, they kept on telling this story. And so the reason I said about a legal case is this. 
the idea of informed consent is 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 sort of at the ethical heart of medicine. Mm-hmm. You have to give a patient the information that allows them to make an informed decision of whether or not they want the treatment. And the principle is a person has a right to self-determination. Well, if a patient goes to a doctor and they're told they have a known pathology, a chemical imbalance, and the drug fixes that, and the research within the professions, you know, on its, in its own textbook says that's not true, that's a form of intentional lying to the patient. Now, I'm sure there's many doctors who had that conversation with patients that didn't know it wasn't true. But nevertheless, if you intentionally lie to a patient, it's seen as medical battery in the United States, okay? So my point of this is not really at the, what was the understanding of the individual doctor, but we had a whole medical profession that said it's not true, yet they promoted this story to the public, and that means to to the patients. So my point was, that's a form of societal medical battery, in essence, that you had a medical specialty who we trust, who has great prestige in a society. Yeah. They, they, they betrayed that trust. And if you look at it in, in a legal context, it is seen as a form of med- not just ne- medical negligence, but medical battery, because you can't lie to patients intentionally in order to get them to, to take a treatment. So one of the responses Mark and I have had is, oh, well, you know, GPs aren't telling people that anymore. Doctors haven't told people that for a long time. We know they are. We we know many doctors are. But even if they're not, the situation we have now is that this idea has been out in the public for such a long time. It's so well established that we have to assume that every patient believes that until they have been told that it's not true. So actually, it is a duty on doctors to tell people that this is to explicitly tell people that this is not established, that there is no scientific evidence from this point for this point of view. And I also feel because another major criticism or sort of major response to our article has been it doesn't matter. Why does it matter? We know antidepressants work. Well, that, that's that's another debate, but it, it doesn't matter. And the only reason they can say that it doesn't matter is because they are assuming that antidepressants must work on some in some similar way on some other underlying abnormality, whether that's a glutamate abnormality or an abnormality of neurogenesis or neural networks or whatever has, you know, is the latest fad. And of course, they are wrong. That's not the only way that antidepressants could be working, inverted commas, could be having their effects. There are other ways they can they could be having their effects. They could be, well, we know they are largely having placebo effects, but they could also be working through producing mental alterations to alterations to our normal mental processes and, and normal mental functioning because they are drugs which alter our normal brain chemistry. And I think unless you are telling patients that, unless you're explaining to them that this is actually a very plausible way that they could be working, inverted commas, i.e. having being a little bit better than a placebo in randomized controlled trials, you're again not really giving people enough information to make a fully informed decision about whether to take the drugs. And this comes back to the point you were making about about where the chemical imbalance myth started and why it, it got off the ground and why Pharma took it up and ran with it as they did in the 1990s. And that relates, I think, to the fact that the, there was this crisis over the use of benzodiazepines. So the use of drugging people out of their misery had come into disrepute because it was clear that the benzodiazepines, which are highly sedative drugs, were just being used to quieten people down and obliterate their 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 worries and, and fears and distract them from you, you know f- from protesting too much about them quite possibly and so it was really important at that point that pharma had a new narrative that that pharma could convince people that no you're not taking something that makes you feel a bit different that numbs you a bit and is just going to distract you from your underlying problems you're taking something that's going to solve them because we've found the underlying problem in the brain so I think that I, I think mm. I think this question about what information 
we are giving to patients is really is really crucial. And it is not just enough to say, well, we don't have evidence that there's a serotonin abnormality. First of all, that has to be said very explicitly, because yeah. otherwise we have to assume that that's what people think nowadays. And, and secondly, we have to explain that, yes, antidepressants could work on some other underlying abnormality, but we have no proof of any, anything else either, and no proof that that's what they do. And that this, there is this other obvious way that they could be having their effects by creating these alterations. And of course, if you are giving a drug that alters the brain over a long period of time, there are likely to be negative consequences. So, so I think you then get into a whole different conversation, and that is the conversation that needs to needs to be happening for people to be really properly informed. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, you have to say it's not true, and you have to say that these agents, your brain, as far as we know, is normal. These agents will perturb that normal functioning. It will yeah. cause long lasting changes. And then, Joanna, the only other thing is, is we sometimes focus on the small benefit in the industry funded trials. I think the patients need to be told about what are the outcomes for real world patients, yeah. especially yeah. over longer periods of time, because those outcomes are poor. Yes. And I think it's pretty evident they're worse than natural recovery rates. Exactly. So I think that should be part of the informed consent, because you're asking me to change my life and to change my brain. I need every bit of information. And so I think that the antidepressants work question has to come into it, which includes what happens in real world studies, what happens long term, and going over to Mark here, what happens when you try to come off these drugs? <laughs> because it's all that's part of informed consent about the step you're about to take if you go onto this drug, you don't know anything that's wrong. You're going to abnormal, abnormalize your functioning. And by the way, no one really knows how that's going to play out over time, what you're doing. And the evidence is not of people doing well. Exactly. And, 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 I, and I want to hand over to Mark. And thank you for both of your comments there. I want to make one comment from an, another angle. You just very quickly, both of you, I think it was in your paper, it was in your paper that about 85% of the population, give me correct me if I'm right, wrong, are believing in this this myth. And 15% don't. So it's more or less that split. Now I'm speaking to audiences of thousands at a time, sometimes twenty thousand in an in a in a sitting between a thousand and and I'm and I have thousands listening. And when I talk about this and I quote you and and, and I have the slideshows, people will are astounded. It's like Oh, this is a completely, you know, and then I'll, and there'll be like, you know, the green room situations afterwards where people are coming up and saying, but I didn't know this. And now this is happening now. This hasn't, this has been happening. I've been in this field now for talking about this for since the, since the mid eighties when I, when I qualified, I've been, because I saw when I was practicing, I was trained in the eighties. So I was told about the DSM and we had professors promoting and we had professors saying, Hey, this is going to be a huge problem in 30 years time, which it is. But I've seen this trajectory in my clinical practice when I practice for 25 years and that's why I do what I do. But the point that I'm making is that today people are still confused. So I can back up your 85% because probably 95% of my audiences think this is what, what do we do now? And so that's why I have these discussions. I just wanted to say that from my experience. Sorry, I think that's, that's you know, that's right. So the, the surveys that we were talking about were, I think in, in America and in Australia, 85 to 90 percent of people think that a, a chemical balance is the cause of depression. They also think other things are the cause. They also think that life events, you know, are the cause. So they have a they have a sort of mixed bag explanation. But I think, you know, as I as I think Jana said, you know, if you think you've got a chemical imbalance, you kind of got to deal with that. You know, someone comes in and says to you, you know, you've got all these things in your life you need to fix, but also you've got a, a deficit of a chemical. It makes complete sense. You better deal with that as well as the other things. So it's sort of I don't know if it trumps things, but it's certainly a very prominent, you know, thought to, to have. Maybe just to pick up on what what Bob and, and, and Jonah both said, you know, with this idea that it is so widespread and it's sort of the default understanding, you know, and it's, you know, we we know it's, I mean, it's it's in the media, you know, it's if you type in serotonin to YouTube, you'll get a thousand different videos talking about different ways of increasing your serotonin with this, you know, implicit idea that low serotonin is bad for you. So it's so it's it's out there. It's prevalent. Mm. It's very prevalent. And so, you know, you could you could say that a doctor really needs to explain to a patient that this is not the case in order to 
correct that. And, and I know, for example, a professor of general practice wrote an article in the British Medical Journal about our paper, in part advocating for the use of antidepressants, but also saying that, of course, we shouldn't tell people that depression is caused by low serotonin. And I know he's running a study that's taking people off their antidepressants. And one part of the intervention in that study is to let people know that depression is not caused by low serotonin. And the reason he's done that is he did a very good analysis of what are the barriers to stopping antidepressants. And one of them is believing you've got a chemical imbalance of the drug mm. solves because, you know, what diabetic thinks it's a good idea to come off their insulin or thyroid deficiency person thinks they should come off their thyroid. So you've got to unpick that idea in order to start talking about the advantages and disadvantages of stopping your medication. I think it's a bit interesting that he's doing that for this small group of people in his study. We really should be doing that for people in society more widely. Yeah. So I think that a sensible step would be a public information campaign aimed to tell people that this is not true. You know, it's clearly needed because, you know, as is attested to by the wide uptake of our article, many people are interested into this topic and because they think that this is the case. It has been used in the past for similar things. You know, people expected when they came in with coughs and colds to their GP they would get an antibiotic because they thought they've got a bug, they need a drug. And, and there was a very widespread campaign in the United Kingdom, I don't know, uh, in America, that told people it's mostly a viral cause for coughs and colds, you don't need an antibiotic. And so I think something similar for depression, telling people it is not you know, a chemical imbalance, would be an important public health messaging. Mm. messaging. What I'd love to do is just very quickly help the audience understand that when you did this analysis, you were looking at the different ways that serotonin plays out in the body. So you didn't just look at one type of, so you analyze a whole lot and there's different ways that you can look at serotonin. And I think it may be useful. I don't know if you can do this in a, in a quite a simplistic way, but just explain the, 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 the papers that you analyzed. It wasn't just one way of looking at serotonin. You looked at different ways. Does that make sense? So it's some sort of a simple way of explaining to people so that they understand how, ex how, how extensive your research has been. I start and you can you can take over Mark. <laughs> so, so yeah, so so we looked at so the research it's it's very difficult and has up to now really been impossible to measure serotonin in the brain directly. So everyone is looking at indirect measures that are, that are ways of gauging what's happening in the brain. So we looked at, for example, levels of serotonin in the, in the blood uh, studies on that. We looked at the measures of the serotonin, the main serotonin breakdown product in the brain fluid. And that's thought to be one of the best reflections of the actual serotonin content of the brain. We looked at studies of the serotonin receptor. So that's the protein on the nerve cells that the serotonin binds to. And again, that's a good reflection of serotonin activity over a period of time. And then we also looked at levels of the serotonin transporter protein. That's the protein that transports serotonin out of the synapse. That's the, the gap between the nerves where the serotonin has its activity. And that is the protein that antidepressants, SSRIs, are work on. They inhibit that protein from transporting the serotonin out of the synapse, therefore you've got more serotonin being more active in the place where it, where it has its action. And then we looked at some studies that that have tried to art, that, that, that have looked at the consequences of giving people a drink that artificially lowers levels of serotonin in the brain, or is, is thought to. It probably does some other things too, but <laughs> it does seem to affect serotonin levels among others. And People have looked at whether that leads to depressed mood in people who are in volunteers who don't have depression to begin with. And then finally, we looked at the genetic studies. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave March to talk about the genetic studies, but, but talking about all the other things, basically, overall, there was no good evidence that, that people with depression have lower serotonin than, with, than people without depression. If anything, there were one or two results suggesting that people might have higher levels of serotonin activity in, in untreated depression, although, although the, the results were very inconsistent and there were different ways of, of interpreting those. 
the study on blood serotonin showed a, a strong correlation between taking antidepressants and lower blood serotonin. So that was very interesting and suggests that there may be some sort of some feedback mechanism that has overshot. So people are taking antidepressants, which temporarily increase serotonin levels. So this, the system adapts to not try and normalize the serotonin levels, but may over adapt. So you end up with even lower levels than, than normal. And so, yeah, those, those were some of the, the things that we looked at. Do you, do you want to explain the genetic studies? Because they were, they were really interesting and very convincing because they involved. So these other studies involve about six, 7,000 people between them. So they're not small, but they're not massive either. But the genetic studies involved tens of thousands, one of them over 100,000. So they were very convincing evidence of negative findings. Yeah. yeah, so I'll talk about the genetics. They're very interesting because one of them is why I went into research in psychiatry in the first place, because it was such a big finding. This People might remember this from the early 2000s. There was a finding that the serotonin transporter gene, which is the gene that John just explained, that controls how much serotonin is in the synapse, it by itself didn't determine who was depressed or not. But when it interacted with stress, it had a very big predictive value on, on who would become depressed. It was a very prominent paper. So it showed that people that had the, the shorter version of this transporter when exposed to stress were more likely to become depressed. And it was in science, the biggest biological journal in the world, and it was proof that there was this clear biological explanation to depression. And it was what got me interested, first of all, in biological psychiatry. And that was why there's been a lot of, it's one of the, one of the bases for thinking that serotonin is involved in depression. And so we went through studies that had examined this area. And since the 2000s, had been 20 years of research. And a group had basically got together all the different studies that had been done looking at this transporter by itself and also in an interaction with stress. And what they'd found was that this first initial finding that got a lot of publicity was a false positive. You know, the sort of thing that happens when you do a study with a small number of people, you're more likely to find odd results. And that's what it, that's what it turned out to be. When you looked at all the studies together, this group actually spent six years doing this collaborative study. They found there was no effect. When you had the shorter version or the longer version, exposed to more stress. So stress had a big effect, I'll put that to one side. Whether you had the shorter version or the longer version, it didn't didn't affect your risk of depression. And they concluded there was no evidence that this was involved in stress wow. sensitivity. Against that, which I think is what makes the findings so strong, as Joanna said, these studies involved tens of thousands of people. They looked at every possible confounder, age, race, gender, none of it, a difference to the genes. It didn't matter which gene you had, it didn't, it didn't affect your risk of depression. What had a very, very clear effect in all the studies was exposure to stress. Adversity, however you measured it, they used job loss, relationship breakdown, physical illness. You know, they weren't even looking for that. They were looking at the genes, but it came up again and again so strongly that that's what determined who became depressed. Things going wrong in life, causing people to become overwhelmed was what led to depression. And all of these studies, and there was another study looking just at the genes themselves, a very large meta-analysis in a prominent journal showing, again, that, that this transporter gene, you know, had no effect on risk of depression. And so putting all those things together, all of, we looked at six different domains of research into serotonin was what uh, allowed us to conclude that there was no convincing evidence that serotonin is involved in, in any way in, in, in the last 50 years or so of research. Thank you for saying that. And the reason I asked you to get so specific is because when people have this kind of factual information, they can make an informed decision, which is what we try and see. If the doctors aren't going to do it, we have to create plat have platforms that are going to tell the truth. And th But once again, and I know, Robert, you, you probably could speak to this why have have the public heard that this is not the you know exactly what you just described that this gene is not it's the stress which all three of you speak about extensively so do i that it's the life's experiences that are the cause not the gene not the brains not the abnormality in the brain, not the serotonin or the glutamate, which is you had a whole thread going this morning or yesterday, Mark, about the Cleveland Clinic and glutamate and all that, you know, how they're still talking about this. It's the life experiences. But once again, are the public 
are the patients being made aware that this is not genetic? Well, I can tell you from my side that the people are astounded when I talk about this kind of thing. Oh, we thought it was genetic. We thought it was serotonin imbalance. So, Robert, would you like to just jump in there and say well, this, this once is, again? Again, one of the problems is that the information that gets promoted to the public, like that first small study would have been promoted to the public, to the media. Yeah. Because it fits with the narrative that, frankly, the drug companies and the American Psychiatric Association or, or the guild, let's put it this, because it mm -hmm. can be an international guild. That's what they want to tell. So they promote that to the media and the media repeats it. But what they don't promote is the finding that, that Mark just talked about when it knocks that down because it doesn't fit their narrative. Now, that's actually mm -hmm. one of the reasons I founded, you know, created this website was because there is so much science that is actually published that contradicts, that counters that conventional narrative. Yeah. And we wanted to be a medium for that. And I have to say one thing about their recent paper. So it made a big splash and, and, and this whole number of downloads are, and, and et cetera and shared. That's extraordinary, okay? And we did have our national public radio program on do a story on it. Now, they basically blamed everything on the pharmaceutical companies and emphasized about 25 times antidepressants work. But guess where their story hasn't appeared in the United States, as far as I know? I don't think the New York Times has covered it. I don't no, think I the Washington Post has covered it. I don't think the LA Times has covered mm -hmm. it. I don't think the Wall Street Journal has covered it. Maybe the Wall Street Journal. I'm not quite sure. I didn't see the it The point either. is, our major media hasn't announced no. this to the public. Why not? Exactly. Now, I think problem, part of the problem is the, the science writers, in fact, have become so convinced in this narrative, they think that's the scientific narrative. Yeah. And they just, it, it just can't even gain traction in our mainstream media. Now, it's better in the UK. I don't know how it is in Australia. I don't think it's very good in Australia, by the way. But at least in the UK, in, in large part, thanks to Joanna and thanks to Mark, that there is this sort of critical psychiatry yeah. movement that comes from within by psychiatrists that has made inroads with the media. But it hasn't happened here in the United States. No. So their paper, which basically, what the reason it's so important in one brilliant short moment, it in undercuts the entire narrative that we've organized ourselves around, the soundbite that our society has organized itself around for the last 30 plus years. It's why yeah. we also medicate our kids. We think they have a chemical imbalance. This undercuts th that entire story in one quick stroke. And you think it would be promoted. You think it would be headline news in the New York Times, Washington Post. And if it were, that narrative would change. Oh, so, totally. You know, I, you know, so I, I blame, I blame the media too because yeah. they don't do their homework. They don't go to, they, they just, they, they, the science reporters so often just act as uh, stenographers, as secretaries. Yeah. And what's told, they don't go to the documents. And so, as much as much as a splash as this has been made in certain communities, it really hasn't made that splash in the United States. The only program that I know of any national importance had people dismiss it a little bit as old news, blame the pharmaceutical companies and said, don't worry, keep on taking your drugs. They're lifesavers. So in essence, the, the, the false narrative was continued. I can attest to that too. But Robert, you, you've had a lot, you speak about in your, in your books as well, how you got quite attacked by your, your own guild when you spoke up against speaks, when you told the truth, when you spoke, You've had a few incidents. Well, in you know, career. yeah, I, there were some incidents, and certainly I got attacked in some newspaper reviews. I have to say it was mixed because anatomy of an epidemic, which initially I was attacked for, like you can't believe in the press. Yeah. I was I was likened to a South African dictator who, by virtue of denying AIDS, had caused a hundred thousand people, a thousand, hundreds of thousands of people to die. That was uh, the first review in the Boston Globe. Oh my gosh! And it, it came yeah. out five minutes after the pub date. And I'm from Boston, so my neighbors are going. I guess Whitaker's crazy, man. Oh my but gosh! But anyway, it, that it was it was hard, and it's it's not like I'm allowed to write for magazines now about psychiatry because I'm seen as biased because I'm not within the conventional narrative. Now, I will say one thing. Every once in a while, there's a, a note of like, oh my God, 
we have a, 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 a an association called Reporters and Editors Association, and each year they hand out awards. And it's actually seen in some ways the most prestigious award because it comes not from publishers, but by reporters and editors. And they did pick Anatomy of an Epidemic as sort of the best investigative book of 2010. But so yeah. there was a little recognition that, oh, this counters the, the conventional narrative. But even so, it's not that I could go write for like I've, I've pitched stories I've given up, but I can't pitch stories to The New Yorker. I can't pitch stories to major magazines because they don't believe it. OK, they are still stuck in that conventional narrative. And that's one of the problems we have and that I get so frustrated with because we in the media are supposed to be honest relayers of scientific information to the public our duties to the public it's not to make the doctors look good our duties to the public exactly to tell both go, sides of the story <laughs> well no it's not to just it's to be good reporters be about what is in the in the scientific literature yeah. and that's where the media has failed so and this this study by joanna mark and colleagues as much as anything is a story of how the media has failed to inform the public of the truth. Of what's I in the totally science. agree. I totally agree with you and can back that up because I get interviewed by media all the time. And every time I tell them something along these lines or talk about mental health from the, you know, the, the angle that we're talking about now, it's, I've never heard that before. And I always look, when I, it's always interesting to see how they, when they report on what I'm, when they actually you look and read the story, how it's very convenient to any kind of, anything related to the, chemical side or the serotonin myth or brain disease sort of myth, they kind of walk their way around. So they'll put other words in and that sort of thing. So it is a problem here. And South Africa too, I speak around the world and I see South Africa is also an issue. Australia, as you mentioned as well. Anyway, that's it's thank you for raising that incredibly valid point. And, and I don't think it's so different. I don't think it's so different in the UK. So the, the most prominent coverage has been in the right-wing media the left-wing media like the BBC has, has been covered in some regional BBC programmes. The main national BBC have didn't, didn't cover it for a long time and then put out a very critical article. And the, the same with other, with other or, or some other left-wing media outlets. And I think, it, I think it's really interesting because if you think about the New York Times, the New York Times have had a lot of articles over the last 10 or 20 years that have been critical of the pharmaceutical industry that have covered antidepressant withdrawal. And it's it's almost like they, they can sort of take a few steps, to, you know, on the road to being critical, but they can't quite take that last step of realising what the overall agenda is. And, and when it is revealed that actually this was all a complete myth that they then back away hurriedly and and get behind the mainstream position of oh no no these are these are brain conditions we need drug treatment it's all a good thing we mm. mustn't rock the boat. There's one advantage that we have with podcasting now. It's opened another avenue for people to explore different opinions and things, and it's it's creating I think also almost at the grassroots people listen to podcasts and it's becoming a great platform. So I I, I think. I don't know, Robert, you, what do you think? Do you think it's potentially a way of getting, disseminating this information? Yeah, no, I, this is the whole point. You have to have alternative forms of channels mm -hmm. of communication. Podcasts are one. That's great. You just said yours has been downloaded 30 million. Our, no, we didn't get anything like Joanna and Mark got, but when we wrote about this on Madden American, we started by writing, uh, you know, having a report about their paper. And then we had a couple of people write about who've been psychiatric survivors, what it meant yeah. for them. And those have been some of the most popular or yeah. widely read papers that we've ever published. So it shows that there isn't an eagerness for this information. You just, but yeah, podcasts are channels for this. The websites can, we try to be a very responsible website so yeah. we can see that we're a good, you know, purveyor of this information, but still, you know, so we've had maybe for through our various articles, 160,000 reads or something, or 200,000 reads. Sounds great. A lot of them have read every article, but New York Times has millions of readers. Exactly. And, you know, and it brings that prestige to this whole story. And I agree with yeah. Joanna. They can nibble up. They can nibble at criticisms, but they just can't take on the big narrative because in some ways, it's almost too huge to even comprehend that that we organized ourselves around this false narrative it's just it's hard to imagine
and wonder what's going to be the tipping point that actually changes that. And that makes me makes me pivot over to if we if we could, and I don't feel like we've dealt with this fully yet. Obviously, this is a huge discussion that we're having, but I would love to just pivot over to schizophrenia and that awful I hate that word. I just think it's awful, but I mean that's the word that's used. And I just the reason I want to bring it up is because all three of you have written extensively and done research in this area, but people are still saying things to me like Oh, it's genetic. I mean, and just the other day, a really good friend actually has uh, spoke about family members that have been diagnosed and how they went for genetic counseling when they had children. I thought, my gosh, this is this is a brilliant person, someone who is highly intelligent and and who questions and who actually works with quite a lot with me and has heard me speak a lot and is still convinced by that narrative. So I'd love us to just transition over and, and talk a little bit about how this is a problem. This is also a problem as much as the antidepressants and depression and all that kind of thing. Now, this is a very similar story. When, when I was training, I remember psychiatrists who I was working, a psychiatrist who I was working for telling a couple they must not have children because they both had a diagnosis of schizophrenia and inevitably there, or, uh, there would be a very high risk of their offspring having having schizophrenia and I remember being really shocked at the time I would say that I think there is some genetic predisposition towards there is something in our genes that probably shapes the way that we respond to the world and in that way you know may have some influence on whether we develop schizophrenia or even whether we develop you know, have a tendency to, to develop depression or anxiety. So I don't think genes are completely irrelevant, but there are some really good studies of the of all the gene studies that are meant to show that schizophrenia is genetic. And what they show is, again, as we were talking about with other research, the studies that have shown the highest rates of genetic influence are the ones that have been highlighted and publicised. There are other studies that actually show very modest genetic influence, if any, and those have been, you know, quietly forgotten about. So that there may be some sort of genetic influence there. I would say not on actually on schizophrenia, but some, you know, there are genetic Something. influences on our personality that are probably relevant in some ways. But actually the research on whether particular genes or a particular genetic makeup has an influence on schizophrenia doesn't sh shows very little evidence of that. And then your work on antipsychotics and the impact and just the whole concept of antipsychotic, once again, antidepressant. Could you speak to that? As with antidepressants, I think it's important that we realise that antipsychotics are not correcting an underlying chemical deficiency or chemical abnormality or any other sort of abnormality. They are drugs that, that produce profound alterations in, in people's mental states I mean, some of the antidepressants at least produce quite subtle alterations and people are not necessarily aware that they're really in, in a different state. But most people who took a dose of an antipsychotic would, know, would immediately feel very different. So, they, you know, they have very strong mind altering properties and the alterations that they produce can be superimposed on, on an episode of psychosis. And one of the alterations they produce is they induce this they induce emotional indifference, emotional numbing, and a general sort of restriction of, of and slowing up of, of thinking. So that if you superimpose that on someone who's in a very mentally disordered state, very preoccupied, maybe having hallucinations, you know, misinterpreting sounds and stimuli, then you know, then you will find that that settles down a bit. That that is that that that, that is numbed and reduced a bit. So that's how I think that antipsychotics are working. And, I, and, and my view is that antipsychotics can be useful drugs when people are acutely psychotic. They can reduce those psychotic symptoms. But if we remember that they are doing that by generally slowing down and dampening down people's brain activity, essentially, you know, then we can see that actually taking them long term might be quite detrimental and impairing to people's ability to function so that's and, and we see that you know we, we see some evidence that in the long term antipsychotics may actually make some people worse and I would always say some people because I think there are some people who people that maybe have you know ongoing psychotic symptoms for whom they may be useful but some people who recover from their episode 
but are encouraged to take long-term treatment will will be harmed by it because it is impairing it. It actually reduces people's ability to function in the long term. One of the things that is, from my point of view, is a little frustrating in terms of how we, in this in the media, is we speak of schizophrenia as a discrete illness. Yeah. Whereas, I mean, I think everybody will actually say that schizophrenia is a term for a variety of pathways into sort of disarray or whatever. So once you understand that, it sort of takes all this, all of this research on genetics and stuff and even outcomes becomes a little problematic because you're grouping a lot of different people together who may have very different things going on inside them, et cetera. Real quickly on the genetics, you know, sometimes one of the, again, it's it's what gets promoted to this, but one more things that Joanna's talking about, we've reported on these studies that say that find there might be some genetics might confer some risk of having a psychotic episode, but it's a minimal risk. And also what what Joanna talked about is maybe the genetics is that, you know, what is your vulnerability in terms of how you react to the stress? Because genes are real, we're built to be responsive to environments. Mm -hmm. So it still does, even if you have that sort of like genetic vulnerability, whatever it might be, or slight risk, you still have to look at environments that people are raised in and, and whether they're stressful and that sort of thing, because there's all sorts of evidence that trauma and stress, particularly early on, does increase your risk for these problems later on. So again, I'm looking at this conversation that we have, and we have this conversation, oh, schizophrenia is a genetic disorder, you're going to be ill for life, chemical imbalance, take your drugs for life. And there's plenty of evidence that if you start anew, when people have that first psychotic episode, that at least a pretty high percentage could get better and then don't need these drugs for life. And then you have to ask the question is, should you be putting people, everyone on right away or that sort of thing? In other words, antipsychotics, if properly discussed and, and talked about in terms of what they do, they could be a useful tool. But we think of them as a drug that fixes a disease and that takes away from doctors using them as a useful tool and using as a useful tool, you try to figure out for whom and for how long. And I actually agree that they can have a use, but I think they're doing great harm on the whole because of this story. I think they block recovery for a lot of people because clearly if you stay on these drugs for a long time, you have all sorts of impairments. And then the other problem we have with this is now we're prescribing antipsychotics to, you know, willy nilly, you know, as an add on to antidepressants to kids because they're so profoundly impactful on dopaminergic pathways and they change the brain, you should try to minimize these the use exactly. of these drugs, not maximize their use. Mm, so well said, Mark. I guess through, through Joanna's historical analysis of the way that these drugs were talked about and the way that they've been presented, that they these drugs were originally called major tranquilizers, you know, and were and were kind of branded to sound like antibiotics, because again, it sounds like a very a targeted treatment. You know, that was a very big you know, I'd done many years of psychiatry before I came across those ideas. That was a very big shift in thinking for me. And it made a lot of sense for me in what I'm seeing in, in patients, that some people are benefited by quieting down their thinking and, and feeling, and other people are, you know, impaired by the sedative effects of these on their ability to function. And I guess maybe I can add just an illustrative story, because now I take people off uh, antipsychotics, and I've seen some things that you know, I wouldn't have seen before practicing as I practiced, which I think which I think explains why psychiatrists are hesitant to, to follow such ideas. So what I saw was, for example, a patient who had been on antipsychotics for many years. When he was a young man, you know, as a teenager, uh, he had very frightening experiences, auditory hallucinations, hearing voices and seeing things. And he was very grateful to be given antipsychotics because they helped to settle things down and he was very disrupted by it. When I saw him, he was in his 30s. It was 15 years later. He put a lot of weight. He had originally wanted to do computer science. You know, he was quite an intellectual guy and had, and had not been able to go to university, not been out of work. And he felt that the drugs were having a negative effect on his ability to, to function in work, in his relationships. He had a young child. He felt he wasn't very present. And so we took him off his drug very slowly. You know, one of the things that I sort of worked on over a year and a, and a half down to very low doses and, and he, he still had psychotic experiences, still heard voices. They, they weren't gone. They'd been there throughout his treatment and they were there when he was on less medication. But he, he, he lost some weight. He 
gained the sort of wherewithal to go and enrol in a course, becoming a, an electrician. And so he's felt like he was back on track in his life. His wife said to me, you know, you've, my husband has come back to me because this idea that he'd been absent for many years. And he ended up on a very low dose of medication. And he sort of said to me, you know, when I was first experiencing these symptoms, it was very frightening. And I was very glad to have these drugs. Now I'm in a different position in my life. I'm not so frightened by these experiences. I'm much more used to them. And I and I would prioritise being able to function, be able to be the breadwinner for my family and be present as a father and a, and a, and a husband. And that had a very big effect on me, seeing his sort of his really his transformation in front of me in seeing how these drugs can be helpful in, in some people in, in ways they can be harmful long term. And so that's very much stuck with me, that story. Yeah, that's that's an incredible story that you share there. All th- thank you. So all three of you have written about the long-term effects. And I'd just like to just spend another couple of minutes and transition to one last area before we have to end it. I just want to respect all of your time. And that is the the long-term impact. You basically you basically alluded to it that there's the long-term impact of taking um, antipsychotics and things like the tardive dyskinesia and that kind of stuff. And I just think it, it would be good to just sort of mention that because you've mentioned the importance of acute state, using it in acute situations, which is definitely so understandable and makes so much sense. But the chronic use does seem to have some effect. And Janet, are you doing the radar study over time? Is that correct? Just looking at the And Robert, you've reported a lot on that as well. Could you just maybe each briefly speak, whoever would like to, on just the long-term effect of chronic use of antipsychotics in in all ages, perhaps, or however you'd like to handle this question. It's a big question. And it's however you feel is the simplest way to handle a complex question. Maybe, maybe I'll start with a couple of points. I think the first point is that we don't have a lot of good research about the long-term consequences of taking long-term antipsychotics. We know that there are these adverse effects that you referred to, the tardive dyskinesia as this movement disorder that's caused by brain, the, the, the antipsychotics affecting the brain and is also associated with some degree of, of cognitive impairment. And that can, that can occur with long-term antipsychotic use. Then there's diabetes, weight gain and diabetes and, and heart problems, sudden cardiac death is associated with the use of antipsychotics. So there are lots of adverse effects. I, I think the question that there hasn't been enough research on is how does long-term use impact on people's functioning and quality of life and overall outcomes? And there have been, there have been various follow-up studies Uh, many of which seem to suggest that people who, Robert knows probably more about these than me, seem to suggest that people who take long-term antipsychotics do worse. Part of that may be because they're the people with the most severe conditions to start with, but but some of those have controlled for some some of the factors that, that, that might predict severity and still seem to be finding some detrimental effect of of long-term antipsychotic use. The reason we're doing the RADAR study is because there are very few studies that have followed up groups who have been randomised either to continue on long-term treatment or to gradually reduce and, if possible, stop antipsychotic treatment. And it's only if you follow up randomised groups that you can, can get rid of the problem of the different severity of, of, of the groups of people who are using and not using antipsychotics. And the randomised studies that have been done and reported so far, one was done in the Netherlands and there was a follow-up of, of seven years and that study showed that people who were, had, had a, a gradual, who were randomised to have a gradual reduction of medication did better in terms of being more likely to make a full recovery than people who were randomised to take maintenance treatment at their long-term follow-up. But short-term follow-up, there there was no difference in terms of their functioning or recovery, and the people who'd had the reduction were slightly more likely to have had a relapse of their symptoms. But in the long term, the people who'd had the reduction were doing better. And then there was one other other study that's, that's reported that was, I think it was done in Hong Kong, and it involved a long-term follow-up of people who went into a discontinuation study of quetiapine. So people were given this antipsychotic quetiapine when they were experiencing a first psychotic episode, 
and then they were randomized either to continue or to have it substituted with a placebo over a period of about a month. They did a 10-year follow-up. They reported that some composite outcome they they had come up with was worse than the people who'd been randomized to discontinuation. But actually, if you looked at all all, all the things they were looking at individually, there was no difference between the groups. And this study wasn't looking at a a gradual program of reduction. It was looking at a placebo-controlled trial where people were transferred onto antipsychotics very rapidly. And actually, the people in the reduction arm didn't didn't stay in the study very long because a lot lot of them did have problems with with increasing symptoms, possibly as a result of of the withdrawal of the retirement over quite a short period. So in my view, what that study shows is there was not much difference between the groups, which which you would predict, because actually the the different treatments didn't last for that long anyway. Most people were taken off quickly, had a few problems, and then got stuck back onto long-term treatment anyway. In the United States, the best sort of naturalistic study, just following people, was done by Martin Harrow and Tom Job. It's an NIMH-funded study, and it's just naturalistic. Everybody gets treated. There's no randomization. Everybody gets treated in the you know, in the hospital in the same way they're discharged, and then they're just going to follow them. Now, in that study, the recovery rate was much higher for those who got off. Now, they weren't taken off. They were basically, they did this, they quit on their own. Now, one of the things that was so fascinating about this was they followed people after they left care. You notice that Joanna said a lot of the people in the discontinuation arm disappeared. Well, it turned out, and by the way, when they first left care, something like two thirds were in fact actively psychotic, okay? But they kept up with them at two, four and a half, seven and a half, 10, 15 years. And what they found was of people who got off, including people who were actively psychotic, many of them then actually found a stabilization place. And it was that group that had the best functional outcomes and they disappeared from the research record. You wouldn't have seen those in any sort of trial because they said to hell with psychiatry, I'm getting out of it. So one of the things is they said, is we saw what happened to these people who left psychiatry and what you see in that group that stabilized Mm. off a lot of stability, A lot of return to work, something like 90% at one point had returned to work. And they were also very stable if they got stable off antipsychotics. Now, just also one small thing in their study is you have, they, they group their people differently by sort of initial prognosis. They had good prognosis patients, bad prognosis, schizophrenia Mm -hmm. patients, and people with a milder psychotic disorder. And what you found was within each subgroup, that it was like, say, the good prognosis patients who got off did better than the good prognosis patients who stayed on long term. Bad prognosis who got off did better than the bad prognosis who stayed on. It was the same with the milder. And the most important thing was this schizophrenia, whether good or bad, who stayed, who, who got off, did better long term than those with milder psychotic disorders who stayed on long term. Wow. So that actually is a cross in what you would accept expect from initial prognosis. The other thing I think we need from a scientific point of view is Mm -hmm. the problem with the discontinuation studies is people go on these drugs and their brains change. Mm -hmm. They become adaptive to the drug. What would happen if we never put people on the drugs to begin with? What's sort of the natural course of the disorder? Now, we don't have much information on that at all, all, but one of the things about the open dialogue form of care was that's one moment where you had a group of, you know, uh, this is in Northern Finland, where they didn't immediately put everybody on drugs and you see these good long-term outcomes. So as as we work into this idea of studying long-term outcomes, you really, in my opinion, want to go back to day one what would be the natural course if we never put people off and then had this discontinuation period? And I think there's plenty of evidence that a lot of people would have a time of a psychosis and really wouldn't become chronically ill. That's what they found with the open dialogue. So I just want to say, as we study this question, and it's so important, lives are at stake, we should bring into the, the research question is, what would happen if we never exposed people? What percentage of people could cover without going on? Mm, excellent. That's really a good point that you raise. Mark, did you want to comment? One thing that maybe hasn't been mentioned, although it's potentially a distressing thing to talk about, which is it seems that long-term treatment with antipsychotics causes shrinkage of the brain um, you know, to a small degree. It, it may be that schizophrenia itself does that or having a, psych- a psychotic condition, but 
there are now randomized trials, which means you can you can point to the drug causing it, where they've looked at a lanzapine versus placebo, and a lanzapine causes a small amount of shrinkage of the brain. You know, which I think just emphasizes that you know there are there are dangers to using these medications, and if you can minimize them, that should be the priority, not not the default of keeping people on them long term. Being aware, being aware of all those adverse effects should make you you know a reluctant prescriber. Famous psychiatrist in in England wrote a, a paper saying psychiatrists should be more cautious about long term antipsychotics, and I think that's that's, you know, that's a very the, good point. What concerns me is the chemical imbalance. You've spoken a bit about chemical imbalance. You've spoken a little bit about genetics or quite a lot about both. But we haven't spoken about this commercialization of brain scanning. And I say that because of what's happening out there with the whole biomedical model and looking for the biological correlates and how brain scanning, as you know, from the mid-1990s became such a thing and neuroreductionism has become a thing. And it concerns me that I am seeing so many people coming to me and saying at conferences and saying, I've had this brain scan. And I think you know what I'm talking about out there. So there's a claim that brain scans, whether it's a SPECT or an fMRI or an MRI, even QEGs being, and that's, a, I use QEG in my research, but the way it's been misinterpreted, the way it's been used as a biomarker kind of situation is a, is a bit of a concern. So I'd like to just throw that out to you and see if you'd like to each maybe comment on that side of uh, of the sort of biomedical models for mental health of how brain scanning is being used as a marker that this is what your brain looks like if you have x and when you do this it's going to go away it kind of sounds like modern day phrenology if nothing else but i'd love you to comment it's not something that's much of a phenomena in the uk and I, I i don't think you'd find many psychiatrists here who would who would support it in any way i mean everyone would agree that you cannot diagnose any mental disorder by doing a brain scan Thank you. And, and you can't track the effects of treatment either. Thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just <laughs> nonsense. I... But the way we, reason we have in the United States is we have profit-driven medicine. People can make a lot of profit by this. I don't know if that's really available in, in the UK. This is, you know, you can, it, it's a type of quackery that, you know, brings in a lot of money. I mean, we've had quackery in American medicine forever. Absolutely. I'll say I'll say two things on that topic. There's actually a large study that's looked at neuroimaging and depression recently published in JAMA Psychiatry, and what it showed was that you essentially couldn't tell people apart who were depressed and not depressed. They said that any changes described less than two percent of the variance. There are lots of differences between people who become depressed and who don't become depressed that might explain that. You know, different socioeconomic backgrounds, genders, and race. In, in, in essence, it's as close to coming, to, it's cl close to saying there is no difference on brain scans as, as it's possible to say in a scientific study. And I, and I think there's the more general comment to be made, you know, th that we're looking for explanations for mind and behavioural phenomena, being depressed, you know, is a series of thoughts and emotions. We're looking for that in the brain. And, you know, that, that it probably represents, you know, a category error, the kind of, the, the equivalent of when your software crashes, opening up the hardware and trying to look in the in the in the chips for the problem. So you know we you know put together all the things we've talked about. We've talked about stresses in people's lives, adversity causing people to become demoralised. We know that occurs to all mammalian species. It's not not restricted to humans. If you beat a dog, it lies down in the corner and, and starts whimpering. If you separate. A chimpanzee from its troop, it, it starts to scratch itself and until it bleeds. You know, that's the response of mammals to adversity, to being overwhelmed. You know, and clearly it's a phenomenon in people's minds and lives, and and the sort of prizing open of the of the back of the computer to look in neuroimaging to find it. You know, maybe a very misguided approach, but maybe a lucrative one. Just, just it, it brings us back actually to where we started because I, I agree. This people's normal understanding of emotion is not not you know not that you explain it by looking at it in the brain but that you explain it by looking at what is what are people reacting to what is going on in someone's life what 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 historical experiences have they had that are influencing how they react to something that's how we explain people's emotions and thoughts and behaviors and it took the chemical. It took this huge promotional campaign to to override people's mm -hmm. innate common sense understandings of what emotions actually are. 
to be able to, you know, promote and market antidepressants in the way they were. Mm, brilliant comments, all of you brilliant. Would anyone like to say any final round of comments? People listening, if they're thinking about their medication and they're reconsidering why they were on antidepressants, for example, after our paper, you know, I would say to everyone, you know, don't stop these drugs abruptly. They can cause lots of troubles. We know that uh, severe withdrawal symptoms can occur to people. The best way to come off these drugs is to do it gradually, do it under medical supervision. There's guidance out there, better in the UK, from the Royal College of Psychiatrists in America, but, but no one should stop their drug quickly. Just thought I'd put that in there. No, Mark, thank you for saying that. And I want to just comment to all the, all the viewers that my interview with Joanna and Robert, we spoke about this as well, not coming off tapering. And Mark, when uh, your interview as well, you go into depth about how to withdraw. And you have a you have a website up, and you have a paper up or guidelines up on the Royal College of Psychiatrists that people can go and access. So thank you for mentioning that. So that's that's really an important comment. Well, I just wanted to say, you know, wow, first of all, and thank you so much for your time, your wisdom, your expertise from the three of you. I know how hard you work and how compassion and how compassionate you are. And how how moved you are to to change the narrative of mental health. And I want to thank you and honor you for that. And thank you for your time. And I'd love to have you back again at some point and talk, take this even deeper and help people even more. So thank you so much. And honestly, keep up the good work because you are changing lives. Sometimes I know you may not feel like you are, but you didn't even know that I knew so much. I've been following you three, four years and how you've impacted my life. And through you, I've managed to impact thousands of people's lives too. So thank you for what you're doing. Keep up the good work. And I look forward to our next conversation. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Thank you so much.